Hello, welcome to the Role of Anatomy and uh, Movement Teacher webinar series. Today we are talking to Shari Barkowitz from New York. He's a Pilates teacher. Shari, if you're going to say hello to the audience. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. As you're coming in, if you want to say hello and tell us where you are joining us from, I'm sure that there are mm -hmm. a lot of people joining us from uh, from the US as well. And um, if you are, um, you know, sorry to say hi to sorry if you know me or if you know both, and if you don't know us, just say hello. We are very um, happy here. So we also have today, just so that you know, we've got Sylvia as one of the panelists. Sylvia is a silent panelist, is here instead of Rosa, who if you have been joining us for the webinar uh, series, um, will be helping us with the, um, with the chat today. So if you want to use the chat to communicate, Sylvia will probably be answering your question. And also at the very end of the uh, session, we will have an, uh, a questions and answers um, time allocated so that we can answer any questions. I can see already that we have a question and answer, which is not a question, so it's Nicole. And um, Nicole, Lydia, and Stephanie from Rhinebeck in New York. Sorry, they are saying hello. Oh, from Rhinebeck. Oh, hi, Rhinebeck. everybody. Hi. <laughs> so they're here, they're probably watching together from the same computer. That's okay, Nicole. She's saying sorry now because she's put it on the questions and answers. That's totally fine. Oh, um, great. But yeah, so join us on the chat. If you do that on the chat, which is on the, on the other button at the bottom of the screen, uh, we'll be able to, um, to communicate with you. For those of us watching us on Facebook, is there anyone watching on Facebook? Um, we are going to be doing a stream, a live stream for 10 minutes, and then we will be going to uh, moving over to Zoom. So if you are watching on Facebook and you want to come over to join us in Zoom, you will be able to watch the rest. And if anyone watching can't watch until the end, we will be sending out the uh, link to the, um, to the replay on Thursday. So all of those that are not many. Great, so let's go over to Shari, because I'm so excited to talk to her. And um, so I'm going to introduce Shari, but it's the first time I actually meet Shari. We have been Facebook friends for a while, and we have communicated through Facebook before, but this is the first time that we actually meet uh, properly. This can be talked. Is this properly, Shari? <laughs> Semi-properly. You know, I kind of... I love these things because I love when I, I meet lots of people online through all of my webinars and such too. And with that, then I do, I feel like, my gosh, I know you now. And <laughs> but we know. <laughs> but we do. It's a new video, isn't it? I, I am actually loving this new, there is something about the space between us right now that is so small and yet so big and then yet so small. I agree. I so agree. And then the same thing with those who are who are part of this observing and that that we're strangely in the same room, even though we're not. I love this. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I, there's something <laughs> really quantum about it. That for me, Fully. It's, yeah. I mean, you know, being from that generation that you didn't grow up with, um, with Facebook or email or anything. Right. Like that, you know, right. You go into that now and you're like, wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. I am really loving it. Princess so Shari is a Pilates teacher, but she also uh, is a biomechanic and an economist. It's a mouthful. It's a yes. mouthful, but it's fantastic. Thank you. Shari, can you tell us a little bit? I'm really interested in the economy. Um, when I read that, I was like, I want to ask her about that. You mean about, did you mean about? A uh, Wi-Fi issue for a second. My, do you mean the ergo ergonomics? Ergonomics, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, how I, do you want to know how I kind of got into it and such? Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I'll tell, um, I'll tell you all. Um, so, yeah, so I, before I was in Pilates, I was in musical theater and with musical theater, I was also studying or working in the physics world, um, especially as a teenager. I was this little weird physics freak. Um, so I started in musical theater when I was four, 
and I got really heavy into physics when I was probably about like 13. <laughs> and, um, and I always wondered, how am I gonna combine these two things, physics and singing, dancing, and acting? Well, I figured that I probably would never be able to do that. And I went on my merry way doing musical theater. I ended up getting this terrible injury and I was partially paralyzed for some time. And I suddenly had to like think about what else am I gonna do in my life? Cause I'm not gonna be, I, I might never perform again. And um, it turned out through many twists and turns that I ended up, um, I ended up getting into Pilates um, from having had this horrible injury and after my recovery. With that, I started getting so interested in it that I, of course, then wanted to be a Pilates teacher. And when I trained, and I trained with Ramana Krasnowska as, um, in, my, uh, in my certification program, I had a lot of questions. I had questions that nobody would answer. And it made me really frustrated. I'm a really, um, I'm a deep student. I'm, I'm, that, I'm that lady who I wanna learn. I wanna learn about everything. I wanna understand why, why does this color wall, why does it look white to me in this way, but it looks a different white to you? And why does the camera angle make the wall look like it's angled when it's not? I wanna know about all things. And I especially wanted to understand just even simple things like why if somebody's knee is hurting them, should they not do this exercise or they could do that exercise? And um, Ramana didn't have answers for me and wouldn't answer questions, which is very, um, which was very typical for her. And, um, and then I would go to many other people or anybody and nobody had answers for me. And um, I decided, well, if nobody has answers for me, then I better find the answers for myself. And I started studying um, anatomy, which then leads to functional anatomy. And because of my world of physics and my desire for that, I started to get into biomechanics. So I started to study anatomy, which leads to functional anatomy, which then ultimately for me led to biomechanics and trying to really understand how does or what are the theories behind how your human body works. And early on in my Pilates career, as I started wanting to get answers to questions and other people had questions, I became the go-to for if you have questions about Pilates, exercises, teaching tools, the human body, go to Sherry. And that, I welcomed it and that has become kind of part of my position. And that if I didn't know the answer, I would find the answer out. And so I just kept deeply educating myself because I was curious and I wanted to help everybody else. And, um, and with that, um, after many years of doing this and so much self-study and working with other experts or working with experts and developing my own expertise um, and working with biomechanists all over the place and in laboratories, ultimately, I finally decided, gosh, maybe I should get a degree in this. And um, so I did, I finally decided I should get a master's in biomechanics. And so then um, typical of me, I didn't just get a master's in biomechanics, I got a master's in biomechanics and ergonomics. And um, ergonomics is, um, and both on the research side of this, plus practical applications. Ergonomics is the study of, um, of how work um, and how work actually affects the human being, affects the worker. And in both biomechanics and in ergonomics, I study um, how musculoskeletal disorders develop in people. And then how do we, um, how do we help people um, who have musculoskeletal disorders restore to balance? Um, so that is what I do on uh, many different levels. So I use Pilates to help us work from the inside out. I use biomechanics to understand what's going on and why do things work? Why do some things work and why don't things work? in Pilates and in any kind of fitness or exercise or movement modality. Um, and then ergonomics in order to help people from the outside in um, for physical health um, in any work situation. It's amazing. It's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. So obviously through the study, um, through the study of like biomechanics and ergonomics, you must have also been having to study quite a bit of anatomy. I mean, I oh, think yeah. in order to be able to understand how the joints work, different relationships. Um, oh, that's that 
<laughs> it's I'll tell you, it's um it's West Twenty Third Street, right? Right there. <laughs> but that's someone's motorbike going fast. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about that, like how, how do you, I mean obviously I am taking that of course, the, the, the idea of, or the question of um, what is the role of anatomy as a movement teacher for you is um, anatomy is, is a given, isn't it? Like, I, don't even I think it is. I believe it's a given. And, um, and you know what, I was... Um, talking to some of my clients this morning and yesterday and saying that I was looking forward to talking with you today and sharing with everybody. And, um, and that talking about what's the role of, um, of uh, anatomy in, um, in Pilates and exercise training at all. And my clients were kind of dumbfounded that anybody would even ask that question because they were like, well, of course, you guys should all know a lot about anatomy. You should know a lot. And like about how the body works. And like, let's recognize, I think it's important to recognize that anatomy is just the list of body parts. Whereas then it's functional anatomy and biomechanics and physical biomechanics that um, is, how does it all work? But um, people always say, implies that they, oh, they're studying a lot of anatomy. Okay, then that means you're memorizing body parts. But then what do we know about the physiology and more of that? And I think that it's really important for us to study what the body parts are, what they do and how they all work together. Um, because ultimately, that's the instrument that we're working with. We're working with human bodies and we're asking them to move in interesting ways. And we're working with people who have injuries or who have recovered from injuries, who are scared that they might get injured again. Um, we're working with people who have goals. They have physical goals, which is why they come to us. And I think that it's most important that we as Pilates teachers understand how each of our exercises and how our method of Pilates, whatever our styles are, classical, contemporary, therapeutic, how our method actually affects a person. And can we really help them achieve their physical goals or are we just given a bunch of exercises um, and like hoping it works? Um, and I'm not okay personally inside of me with that kind of risk of like, I hope this works. Um, I want to, be able to be so effective for my clients that I know before we go whether this is going to work for the moment or the long term or it's not. I want to be able to have that x-ray vision of knowing what's going on inside of my client and thinking about how this is going to help my client progress over time to, uh, to address their physical goals. Um, and that requires something well beyond our um, intuition or a sense um, that I believe that to be, to be able to predict what will or won't work for the moment and for the long term, we need a deeper education beyond um, intuition. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the discussion originated, for those of you watching that don't know where this all started, this webinar series about, you know, why are we questioning the role of anatomy or are we questioning it? Uh, I mean, some of us have uh, been involved in, in the world of anatomy and understanding the body. Um, so, um, yeah, it came from, from originally from a Facebook post that I uh, posted on my private Facebook on one day, just one of those times when just, or I just put something on Facebook and then I go like, why did I do that? I can't do that. I just, um, <laughs> I, I was having a, an internal thinking in which I was, I had had a chat with someone. I had had a conversation with someone about um, the dryness or what she perceived as, a, as anatomy being a dry subject. For me, personally, for those of you also watching that don't know who I am, I am, um, deeply studied students of anatomy, possibly for forever. Will we ever get to know, I will never really get to know the body. I mean, it's, it, uh, yeah. It's like going out into outer space and trying to sort of understand the universe by going, going inwards. And through, um, and I do that through many different ways. I, I am studying a, a postgraduate diploma in anatomical sciences. 
at the moment in Edinburgh, at the University of in, in Edinburgh. But I also do dissection with, uh, you know, person with Gil Headley, with functional fascia. Uh, but it, anyway, going back to the conversation that I was having with this person, this person was feeling that the study of anatomy for her was very much a dry subject. That was very much like what you have just described, Shari, of like, um, anatomy is the study of parts. Is the study of objects of um, here is the humerus and here is the vertebral trachea and, and here is the lesser trachea and this is the acetabulum and the pelvis and the head of the humerus and um, how for her that that in the past in her study of anatomy had been such a disembodied experience yes in which anatomy had been um, a study of a uh, sort of outside object that did not that she did not feel and she did not sense. So then she had gone into a journey of um, of um, different different research, body research, really really valid. But she had completely um, kind of closed anatomy into into the cupboard and like not looked at anatomy because she felt that anatomy for her was getting in the way of her movement and um, therefore also in the way of her teaching. She was not a Pilates teacher. Yeah. I could so appreciate that. Um, it was very much taught to us at first, um, I'll say in uh, with Romana, that you didn't need to study anatomy, that it would ultimately get in the way of your movement. And um, I strongly disagree with that. Um, if you're only looking at as disembodied little parts that you have to memorize, when you have to memorize them and like that's, you have to get through that part. It's like learning the alphabet before you can actually write a big beautiful, like a beautiful poem or the great novel. Um, you got to learn your alphabet and you got to learn your grammar. And then you can write some pretty incredible things that you can transmit to other people. Uh, that if we can get through the bits and pieces first and then try to figure out how does this relate to my own body, to other people's bodies? How can I use this as my, um, as your like superhero power of like that, like x-ray vision x-ray of like, vision. yes, right. That, yeah. oh, I can see why that shoulder, why, why, oh, this person like for Pilates in particular is doing like pull straps or the hundred or breathing or any other exercise where we have this flexion and extension at the shoulder and oh, I could see why there's a dysfunction there. And this person's goal is maybe just to get strong triceps. And how am I, like, if I understand what are the bits and pieces and how they work together, I can help this person. If I also want to help somebody who's been injured, not get re-injured and retrain them neurologically and um, neuromuscularly, I've got to know um, how it goes and to be able to figure it out in a way and work with people, help you understand it in a organic way, as opposed to these bits and pieces of machinery. But how do we make us, how do we help ourselves when we learn anatomy and learn then beyond anatomy to physiology and functional um, and functional anatomy and biomechanics? How do we get this to be like, oh, right, we're working with organisms. We're working with people who's, with beings whose trillions of cells all organize with each other to make you and um and how do we get them to all coordinate in a way that's functional that's to me like really like oh, i'm gonna use a dorky word that's really zippy um that's really i don't know if i've ever said that word before um it's totally that's to me exciting of like how do i make this organ organism function or how do i help this organism this person function well inside of themselves, restore that function. And um, if we can bring that kind of excitement to our students of Pilates, uh, our students, the teachers, I don't mean the clients, I mean the teachers, then they can have a greater grasp of what it is that they're doing and why and what works well and why does it work and what doesn't work well and why that doesn't work. Um, And so that we can be really effective. And I just said, and this might be something for a little later, so don't hesitate to hold me off, of that there's a difference between what Pilates teachers, what I believe Pilates teachers um, ought to know or would benefit from knowing, the kind of education that they would benefit from, versus what our clients necessarily need to know. Um, you know, how much anatomy does, does your client need to know that you're working in there? Yeah. You know, 
Okay. I, from my perspective, which of course could be different than anybody else's, from my perspective, I think that our clients don't need to know that much, but they could use a little bit. Like they, it helps them to know, oh, like just knowing ball and socket. Do you remember ball and socket? And like, ah, oh, that's how your leg rotates or your socket can rotate around the ball. That just helps them, they're images of movement. I'm not calling it an acetabulum, an ephemeral head. I'm not talking about all the little bits and pieces in there and trying to give them an anatomy lesson, but it's a little bit of functional anatomy, a little bit of, um, we can have a little bit of physical biomechanics just in the simple words of you've got a ball and you got a socket and either the ball is going to move around in the socket or the socket's going to move around the ball or both are happening at the same time. So imagery can be really helpful and having it be imagery that's based on real things as opposed to, um, as opposed to, I hear a lot of people t give images that are actually like backwards of the way the joint or the muscles work, and then it won't be as effective. So when you know, the more a teacher knows about how the human body works, then our images can even be more effective for our clients. So to, I kind of went off on the side, but, um, but that do our clients need to know um, anatomy? No, I don't think so. Um, I will, uh, I will use words that sometimes I have to translate. Um, like I'll say, okay, the back of your pelvis, your sacrum, and or the ba uh, find your way to the center back of your pelvis, or find your sacrum, the back of your pelvis and the wall. If I want to start to educate them on a word, not what it does or um, it, the, like how it interacts with the sacrum with your ilium or anything like that, but just if I want to use a body part word, I'll go back and forth between the back of your pelvis, the center back of your pelvis, your sacrum, to educate them on that word so that we can just simply have a conversation, like I can use that as a cueing, but I'm not necessarily gonna teach them um, about how the sacroiliac joint uh, actually works. Um, it's not necessary for them to achieve their goals. When they're looking to achieve their physical goals, they're looking to move. We need to move them in the method that you teach, again, we have different styles. In your method has a way of helping them achieve their physical goals, great. Their physical goals require physical movement. It's not intellectual, it's physical. Um, a little bit of knowledge sometimes helps. Ah, you can, can you imagine rotating your ball around the socket, uh, your socket around the ball, your ball in the socket. Um, and, but, um, but if we get too anatomical and too sciencey on them, then they're thinking and having an intellectual experience rather than a moving experience. Um, and it's the moving experience that's gonna help them achieve their physical goals. Okay. Um, if I might continue with that, I remember when I was being trained to be a teacher for the first time, they were, they were definitely saying that anatomy will get in your way as a teacher and that, um, and so teachers didn't need to know about anatomy. And that certainly, of course, clients wouldn't need to know about anatomy. And it seems that there might be a faction in Pilates that believes that, that people, like teachers, can't separate the two. But we can, if we're really mindful. You can have a lot of education, but that doesn't mean that's what you're always, you're not teaching those words of it, of the words of your education. You're not, I'm not teaching my clients biomechanics. They don't need that. But I know the biomechanics of it. And that helps me be a more effective teacher. Yeah, and I think that I, I, yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent in in and like you were saying about the um, the images that you then choose, which uh, in my own experience, my imagery that I do use, I use a lot of imagery. I saw it. And it's me too. Uh, but um, the images come to me. I don't have them. They come. They just arrive. <laughs> and, and they come from having experienced the body in so many different ways, through my own embodiment of my own being, through my own embodiment of my own breath and my own body, sure. in a space, plus all the other research that I can do, whether it is through reading books or doing some dissection in which I can experience um, you know, the different textures and the different uh, layers of relationships between different um, areas of the body um, to also having worked with other bodies that are 
alive and living and, 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 and moving and, and seeing and being inspired by the way that they find their own movement. But those images, yes, yes. Those images tend to be um, kind of coming from the inside as opposed to external imagery. That can um, be a little bit, uh, sometimes a bit more of, because I believe that imagery can sometimes be a bit disembodied as well. Like some, some of the images, can, like what you were experiencing or saying about hearing an image that you're going, oh, that kind of almost goes against what movement there is in that joint. Um, so yeah, right. That, right. informing yourself is... I think that's it, exactly. If we, to be really effective teachers, and I think when we're, when we're effective teachers and our clients are able to, and I'll say this phrase over and over again, they're able to achieve their physical goals or they're able to even just achieve an exercise or a set of connections. And for me, it's always about internal connections people are making. When, um, for us to be really successful in these ways, um, we, the, having the most effective tools is really great. And when the images come from knowing how the human body works, then, and like, and really knowing it, not just because somebody said it to you and you're blindly accepting, but because you have investigated beyond blind acceptance into critical thinking, which leads to creative thinking. When we really get that way, then our images are extremely effective. Then when you understand how the transverse abdominis connects and how the, where it is and what the action really is and how the different uh, other soft tissues respond to the transverse abdominis or my, my favorite part of the human body, the thoracolumbar fascia. Anybody I know who's watching this right now is laughing I'm like, of course, Sherry said thoracolumbar fascia, my favorite part of the body. And like what happens in that, then you can change your cueing and your images to be that. And it's real. It's the right image for the action that you're looking to have happen internally or this external large thing that's going on. And um, it works every time when you really know what's going on with the body. And then as opposed to a false set of, or an imposed image, that isn't how the human body works. And you're wondering why is this movement or this exercise failing every time? It's failing because you're, the understanding of what's going on is not, um, is not appropriate. And, um, and I must say, and that's from very well-meaning teachers, from extremely well-meaning teachers, we have, many of us have been taught things that are really inappropriate. Either they won't be effective or they could hurt people um, or they'll be effective for a short period of time and then, and then level off, they won't be effective any longer. And, um, and the more that we genuinely understand how the human body works, the more effective we really can be. We don't have to hit that wall of frustration of like, what am I doing? I don't really understand what I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to um, just say um, to the audience, those watching, if you have got any questions, it is now a good time to start putting them onto the questions and answers at the bottom of the screen. So if you don't know where that is, you can just hover over your screen, right at the bottom, through about the centre, there's a Q&A, you can click in there and you'll be able to write any questions uh, there. Um, Sylvia, I think, is also reminding you on the on the chat about this and telling you where where to go. Shari, can I ask you because throughout, you know, you uh, talking about biomechanics and the the word biotensegrity was uh, um, really coming up for me, and I mm -hmm. really sort of kind of hesitated. Should I should I bring that up? Should I not bring it up? Can I ask what you? So glad you're bringing it up. About? Around the, uh, the uh, around yeah around integrity and, and you know biotensegrity, can you tell us a little bit about whether you yeah what your thoughts are around it? Yes, yes. Um. So um. So biotensegrity is a concept created by Stephen um, by Stephen M. Levin, who is a very good friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine because um, it was many years ago that I was searching for some information to try to. Uh, as I was doing research on how do we have opposition in the human body? What is opposition? and How does that develop? And it's actually what really, it's probably what really propelled me into, um, into the world of research and my pet project with our lumbar fascia. Anyway, I found, um, I found a comment that uh, Stephen Levin made on some blog. Um, and um, 
So he's the creator of this concept. Um, and I think it's a really remarkable concept um, of biotensegrity. And, um, and um, I have worked with him and, um, and other people in the biotensegrity field. And um, when I decided to go get my master's in biomechanics, Stephen said to me, oh, don't let them ruin you. And, um, and I said, no, I said, I wanna do this and keep, and I already was an unofficial biomechanist. And, um, and I wanted to be more official and, um, and uh, which gets you better funding for research. Um, and with that, um, I said, there's a bridging of the gap here of biomechanics and biotensegrity. Um, sadly, my colleagues in biotensegrity seem to be demonizing biomechanics a little bit. And I think that that's a shame because they're two very different concepts. They are both models. When you have a model, you create something to be able to represent something else. It's imperfect. Every model is imperfect. Um, what's, a, what's a model? Our model of the solar system, that we have the sun in the center and then the way that our um, planets and moons revolve around, it's completely imperfect. It's just a concept that helps us be able to study more, be able to have a conversation, start to do some research. Um, maybe do a lot of research, but it's just models are always imperfect. So the model of biomechanics is imperfect. However, it's very effective to try to understand the forces within a joint and where the forces within the body and how do they relate to each other and how does it, um, how do, let's just, just speaking strictly on the musculoskeletal or myofascial skeletal uh, level that um, how does all of this relate to each other on a mathematical level so that maybe we could create um, hip replacements, maybe we could create proper crutches or understand how to use a cane on what side of which leg or, um, or create um, a, a plate for a, in a leg or in the skull or we use this mathematical sense to try to understand the human body and help people. Um, how to create a pacemaker, um, many different things. And so it really serves a very strong purpose, but it's only a model, it's totally imperfect. And then we have, um, oh, and I should even say like, how to make a pair of sneakers or trainers that you're wearing, tennis shoes, that's gonna be in a way that's gonna be effective for you. So many different things. Um, but it's, it's a model, it's totally imperfect, but it's been really um, useful. Biotensegrity is also a model. It is a model that is very young and it has very little to nearly no research behind it, supporting, giving it evidence, but it's very interesting. It seems like it's something that we might want to embrace. And it is certainly something that I um, embrace recognizing that there's no evidence to support it. Um, that, um, that this concept that our soft tissue tension might be suspending our bones, that our soft tissue tension and our soft tissue relates to each other. And, um, and this uh, tensional network within our body, it's really a wonderful concept. And it explains a lot of things about human movement and support, or it seems to explain that. But it doesn't have mathematical qualities to it. And you can't build a, prosthetic hip from it, that's biomechanics. But biotensegrity can help people understand movement in a different way. Biotensegrity is a very um, organic kind of concept. And when you think in that way, you move differently. And these two concepts are vastly different, but I think that they can really um, cover just two different areas of understanding the human body. And I don't think it needs to be one or the other. They just are utterly different, trying to explain how the human body works. Um, and I, I study both of them. And, um, and I often wanna invest myself even too much, I think, too much into biotensegrity to be the, to, I want to be the one who provides the evidence for it as, um, as new creations and new ideas, people get frustrated. Like the, I know my biotensegrity family is frustrated that biomechanists won't accept biotensegrity. But biomechanists and those of us in the research world, we don't accept anything until you show me evidence. 
and there isn't evidence yet. It's a great idea, and I would like there to be evidence for it. Um, and so that's where I'm at with it for the moment. Do you have any thoughts on what I just shared? Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I think it's, it's great. I'm really inspired to hear that you are feeling that they both can coexist with each other. Oh. I am uh, someone that, that really likes that, the idea. I mean, hence why I'm running this webinar series. I'm really into the idea of polarity at the, at the moment for, for a, quite a few years, the last couple of years. I see polarity everywhere. Um, I think that's awesome. I think that's so great because I, I think if we get ourselves locked into there's only one concept, then we really limit ourselves. And you know what, I'm from New York City and in New York City, we're very black and white. We're very like, it's this way or it's that way. You know what though, that's not how it really is. And that's one of the things that I love about this webinar series, to be able to hear you speak and to, you know, I can really resonate with a lot of what you are saying. And, and then, you know, listening to, say, uh, Pete Black about you the other day, who has um, had a structural background on anatomy and now has completely put anatomy to one side and is one of those that says anatomy gets, well, I'm not going to paraphrase what he's saying, anatomy gets in the way, but he's all about self and, and, uh, and I can resonate with him. Uh, the, the, you know, there is this... Um, sense that when you are talking about biomechanics and biotensegrity um, and you being, you know, having come to study biomechanics in an academic way after having discovered biotensegrity, that for me, Shari, is very inspiring. Oh, I, thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I'm now studying anatomy um, in an academic way and, and the way that I, you know, of course when I'm at the university talking to my, um, my teachers there, I'm not um, able to perhaps express some of the things that I have researched and I do understand from the fashion world because they just won't accept it. They will not no. accept it that, um, you know, they will not give fascia the role that fascia is given as a fascial system, integrated fascial system in our fascial world. Of, um, right. Um, you know, can I get information and inspiration from both worlds? So I'm excited the... about you doing that with biomechanics and biodiversity. Thank you, thank you. And I, I think that, um, I think that when a new concept comes into play and people get fascinated by it, and I, I do call it the fascia fascination, um, that like when, I'm sure I'm not the only one who calls it that, but, um, but we become fascinated and we want it to be true. We want it to be so because it seems to make sense. That is awesome. But then we need, I believe, we need evidence ultimately to support it. Um, but. Um, but I think very often when we get so excited about something, then we don't, we can't understand why other people aren't equally as excited about it. And we certainly cannot expect the research world to be excited about anything that doesn't have research to it. And so, um, so as like my dear friend, um, Stephen Levin, he gets very frustrated. Why won't biomechanics, um, the world of biomechanics accept him? They won't accept him until there's research. Um, yet, is it something that we could start playing with? Oh, yeah, we could play with it. Why the fascia world right now, again, it needs, it just needs more research. Like five papers isn't enough. It just needs more. And so it just needs more time. And, um, and I believe that as there is more time and there's more research and there's more ways to figure out how do we um, quantitatively study something that we're all obviously so fascinated by in this the biotensegrity world and the fascia world how do we quantitatively study it then um what what kind of equipment do we need what kind of studies do we need to create um so that it is something that we can rely on rather than suppose about um that's when it'll be it will be accepted into a broader um a broader use a broader concept um, and in all different fields. And it might take a long time. We don't know. It might take, you know, it might take another 10 years. It might take a hundred years. Um, and, uh, but I think that we can work with this plurality um, and, uh, and we can expand our ideas of something that is, okay, research with lots of evidence, bio, uh, biomechanics, and 
yet there are still questions of like, I'm not so sure about that. And then we seem to have answers in um, biotensegrity and we can use the two of them together. I mean, that's really what my world is. So, um, so I think it's fascinating to play with all different sides of it. And I encourage that with everybody. Yes, right. Sorry, we've got a question uh, from someone on the questions and answers. Should we move over to that? Sure, yeah. sure. I don't want to take all your time because um, I'm so grateful. I want to tell our attendees that you are in the middle of your working day and oh, yeah. that you will have stopped your teaching and you're going back to your teaching and not so long. So we will have uh, Shari here uh, for as long as we have some of the uh, other people. Uh, and before, so um, so Caroline is asking, saying hello, Shari, and he's asking, Hi, what Caroline. What resources would you recommend for Pilates teachers to further explore both functional anatomy and biodynamics? I think she might have learned. You know, actually, biodynamics is my theory okay. on the human body, so okay. either she may or may not have meant to write biodynamics. It's Thanks, Caroline. Funny. That it, yeah, right, that is my actually greater theory on the human body. Um, and yeah, so keep going, sorry. <laughs> this is saying, not just courses, but also websites, books to develop further from basic understanding. Thank you, Caroline. All right, um, thank you, Caroline. This is, uh, it's great uh, to, um, to ask about this. Um, the first part that I'm gonna share with you is rather boring, so prepare thyself. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I think it's fascinating, which I think that, um, I think taking an anatomy and physiology course is actually a great thing to do. Um, people avoid it, they go, oh, I don't wanna work that hard. But if you can just get the basics down with taking an anatomy and physiology course, and you don't even have to do every system of the human body, just do the musculoskeletal system. And to be able to even learn the theory on muscle engagement, to learn um, the sliding filament theory of how muscles engage starts to change everything. To even um, to understand a little bit about how, um, how neurological signals happen and then the muscle does engage. How does this all happen? So um, the first thing I did, and you could, you could even do an online course. You could do like the least expensive anatomy and physiology one online course. And man, are you gonna learn a lot. That's gonna then be able to take you to the next level because you can't really, I, I believe, you can't really get into functional anatomy and, and biomechanics or, um, or bio, tensegrity even to really understand things, let alone um, the concept of biodynamics, um, without having the super basics. So I would sign yourself up for musculoskeletal uh, system anatomy and physiology. Get an online course, start reading. Um, it's going to be boring. It's totally textbook. But then you might get fascinated like I did of like, huh, this is what happens at a neurological junction? What? This is what happens when a muscle engages. We think this theory is how it happens. Ooh, this is what happens with, um, with cells in many different ways. And then that kind of understanding can bring you to other things that I think will be really helpful. Simple things like getting an anatomy app. Um, so I use apps from 3d4medical.com. Um, they're great. Um, complete anatomy, which is 3d4medical.com. Complete anatomy 2020. Oh my God, it's so great. Just get curious and, um, and just click on a muscle and it gives you information about that muscle. Just plain anatomy information of where it is, where it connects from what to what, and then a little bit of physiology, like what it does. Um, and um, that's just a fun thing to do is have an anatomy app and just start clicking around and learn a little bit about, um, learn a bit, little bit about each of these bits and pieces. And um, some of them, I think, complete anatomy 2020 with that, um, you can uh, even click and be like, what movement happens in this joint? And you can watch a little video of movement happening. And that gets you start to like, that starts to get you buzzing about like, oh, I had no idea that there was a muscle called, I don't know, adductor magnus. And it kind of works like an inner thigh muscle and a hamstring and adductor and a hamstring at the same time. Whoa. Um, so to geek yourself out on, um, on the basics in that way, I think is really important. And then you'll start to, um, then I think that starts to help one become even more adept at looking into functional anatomy um, and 
biomechanics. You have to get that bottom, bottom line, that foundation first. I hope that's helpful, Caroline. Great. And you know what? I should actually ask, answer that, um, answer more to that um, and say, um, and email me if you have questions. And I say this to everybody. If you have questions about a body part or anything that goes on, Pilates or biomechanics, just email me. Oh, and Caroline, you just wrote that you're ready to geek out. Awesome. Yeah. So if you um, geek out, awesome. If you geek out, you're like, ah, Dr. Magnus, I love it. Awesome. Would you email me info at the vertical workshop and tell me, or dot com, and tell me that you're geeking out over at Dr. Magnus and I'll geek out with you. <laughs> That's really lovely, Shari. Shari, it would be really nice to also share with our audience your um, your website and your you know any resources that you have for teachers. Because I know that you do run also courses uh, for for teachers. So I don't know if you mind typing there on the messages so that everyone can no, see. No, my pleasure. Well. My pleasure. And you know, I should have said to Caroline and to everybody else, another great place. I don't usually like to like sell my stuff to like start learning about functional anatomy stuff is a work is my webinar um, and actually in person workout um, workshop as well. Um, which is I do this teacher intensives. It's a, it's a full comprehensive continuing education program. But the very first one is functional anatomy, um, biomechanics and biotensegrity um, with applications to Pilates. Um, it can be done as um, a recording of a webinar version of it that I've done, or in Vienna, um, May 8th to uh, May 8th through 10th of this year, 2020. Um, it's going to be in person, and that information, all that information for all of that, is on my website under Continuing Education. And um, so that's actually the very first fundamental part of my entire Continuing Education program, which is biomechanics, biotensegrity, and functional anatomy. So I forget to like tell people. Perfect. That's great, sorry. <laughs> that wasn't All right. Great. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, I should tell you guys about that. So I just put in my website, theverticalworkshop.com, um, and my email is info at theverticalworkshop.com. So nobody has to figure out how to spell my name. Just info is great. Um, and then, uh, verticalworkshop.com slash hmm you know what we can we could perhaps get a link from you and then we can put that when when we do the replay we'll put that on the comments on the bottom so that, that would be great our, and, and then that will always be there because here the chat Super. actually that will appear because people don't see it on the replay so what we'll great. make sure guys is that we'll get a uh, a link from, from Shari. Um, Great. And you know then I can maybe share some anatomy and physiology books there too and other things yeah, if that's yeah. possible. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I'm going to tip in to also say that we've got our online course also coming up uh, in March. Uh, I hope it is Caroline might be on the online course already. Um, oh, great. Moving fascia foundations course, which is based on, on the understanding of fascia as a cellular level and then working out how that is applicable to movement. Teaching. Excellent. You need to know about the cellular world of fascia. Well, if they want to work as fascial practitioners or they want to say that they work in fascial movement, it's important to understand what happens in the connective tissue at cellular level and to understand the nomenclature and the difference. And, um, yeah, I'm a true believer that that is uh, important as well as the embodiment of it. That's excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So I don't think there are any more questions. Um, All right then. It, um, yeah, it's been a very uh, short question <laughs> this, this time. It's been a pleasure to, to talk to you. Um, it's, um, it's so great to, to speak to a Pilates teacher as well. We haven't had a Pilates teacher yet. And, um, on, on, on the webinar series. It's the first time that we get to, to speak to Blackest Teacher. You know, oh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm having a cup of tea and earlier, before when we were doing it, I was like doing this and then I realized, oh, that's exactly what I mean, This was not done on purpose. It really was not done on purpose. And it's really <laughs> that's great. I was really shy to get my cup of tea and have a drink because I thought people are going to have done that on purpose. I really haven't. 
Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> it's brilliant to have a flat speecher. And to, you know, to hear that you are, um, you know, doing such an interesting work in not just with movement, but it sounds like you've got a little bit of a, of a mission there that is, um, is an important quest of bringing I do. the research. I'll tell you, I do have a mission. I do. Yeah. You know, I just, one thing that I, beyond, beyond the um, being able to like help people like move their shoulders better or by knowing what the, what the anatomy, let alone the biomechanics of the shoulder is or of the knee and such, just my whole concept of how I'm going to, how I use Pilates um, for my clients uh, is altered by what I've studied in biomechanics or where I've developed in biomechanics. Um, I mentioned before my pet project um, is the thoracolumbar fascia or the lumbodorsal fascia. And, um, and um, my study of it, my deep research in it has helped me explain and understand why I feel what I feel inside and what I wanna share and impart with others and take an intuition into uh, evidence-based application and it makes for such effective um, such effective work that we can use do in Pilates or any other um, physical uh, activity but again that the more that we understand the human body the way our concepts change or develop in, um, in what it is that we do, it can be, it's so useful to allow your brain to expand by digging inside, allows this great expansion as teachers and, um, or uh, in Pilates or in anything. And I just wanna encourage that education. People get afraid of education um, and they go, oh, it's gonna be a lot of work. I don't wanna do that much work. Well, uh, sometimes when you invest in work in one part, it makes everything easier later on. Or, oh, I don't really want to have to think. Uh, but then we wonder why we're so bored. That if we do start thinking, it inspires our energy and our ability to, um, to thrive in our, in our work that we do. Um, so I know for myself as a Pilates teacher, and I'm glad to be the first uh, Pilates teachers in, in, in your web series here, um, that it's, it's broadened my, or broadened my abilities, it's elongated, or I will continue to elongate my life as a Pilates teacher, because to be constantly intrigued by the human body, and then how do we play with the method, your particular method, my particular method of Pilates, to be able to give such longevity to us. And I think that the more, um, the more we explore, the more we have available to us. Um, and it becomes very exciting. So I'm glad to be your first uh, Pilates teacher in this mix. <laughs> right. <laughs> one, one thing that is important that you have mentioned a few times, and this is something that I definitely, um, it's something that I, I'm very aware of and I always teach in my courses, is the idea of um, uh, we are using models, even when we are studying anatomy, and we're looking at, you know, the netters, uh, um, you know, the, or any, any, any anatomy book. We're looking at sure. That this is, you know, we have to recognize that this is, uh, these are images that have been, that are representing a model that whenever we are looking at the body, we need to apply, we are applying uh, our own model. We are using a model in order to understand that reality and, and, I think it is very important for me. It is very important that I am aware that I am using a model, whatever it is that I am uh, that I am studying or that I'm even teaching. We do use our own uh, model of um, of um, going through the partial body. We look at the organs as well as we look at the visceral fascia, as well as we look at the musculoskeletal fascia. But very much is a model and I do uh, say that you know in order for me to teach you something a uh, five months long course that has got segments of like here we're looking at this here we're looking at that I have to apply a model and as long as I am 
aware that that is a model, perhaps I can then have a little bit more of an integral understanding of the body. Um, because I am aware that I am using yes. a model. And you mentioned that when you were talking about biomechanics and biointegrity. And I think that very much we can sort of like hold on to something and say, this is the truth. And is it? But it's or not. It is it it's a just a model. I understand. I just got glasses recently. I, I need to go and pick them up. I've never had glasses before, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have glasses like you, and I'm really looking forward to it. But for me, it's like it's like putting glasses on. It's like being aware that I am looking at the world now through these glasses. Mm -hmm. It's the same with dissection. When we study dissection, the moment I get my knife and I go into the body, I've got an intention, and it's that intention that is going to give me a result that I am looking at. Right. And my model. Right. It's the model you have in your head already that is setting up for what it is that you're looking for. You're going into a fascia dissection. And so then your, your whole concept has now just become about fascia. Or previously, people would go strictly into um, a muscular dissection and they disregard the fascia completely. It's all models. This makes people very uncomfortable um, to recognize that we're only seeing things or approaching anything from what we have preconceived as a notion. It's very uncomfortable for people. Um, and, but that's just the reality of any of it, um, that we come with our built-in mo models and we're always working with some kind of model. And that's just, that that's, seems to be a human way of thinking. And then ultimately, if we can gather other many different models, we can look at any um, scenario with a much more three-dimensional view, as long as we recognize there isn't just one model. That um, we can't have, have we gone from the musculoskeletal model to now the fascia model, and so now the musculoskeletal model, forget it, we don't believe it, it's only the fascia model. Or can we merge these two together? Or it was biomechanics, but no, now it's biotensegrity, or isn't it both? And um, so, right, and when we, when we do a dissection, okay, I'm focusing this, I can only focus on one thing at one time. And so I'm gonna focus this dissection on looking at this particular fascia and, but do I discount that everything else exists? So I, I agree, it's again, it's really, I think it's really uncomfortable for people to recognize that we are looking through a set of glasses and, um, and, how many different lenses can we put on is what I, is what I encourage us all to do. Like get, like delve in and develop an expertise in many different lenses, um, many different models. And then we have a really broad way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. That's great, Sorry, I love how you're bringing all this eclectic, yeah. I love that you're bringing it out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's been a, a total pleasure to, to speak to you. I'm very aware that you have got um, another class starting. Thank you. Half an hour time, less than half an hour time. And I would like to, you know, um, give you your break. And hopefully Thanks. <laughs> I'm so glad that I was able to wiggle this in today. And just thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you all who have come to uh, the live stream and who will be working with the recording of this, um, that we open up our minds and share information and some we're gonna like and some we're not gonna like. And you know what, you can take, or you can take what you want and you can leave what you, what you don't wanna take. And, um, but having conversations like this is so great. And, and, and I'm, so, I'm so glad to be part of it. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Shari. I, I am really honored that you, you are willing to take part of, on this conversation. Always, always. And, and it's a great opportunity to connect with you as well and to listen. For me too, with you. Thank you. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone on the, on the audience. Next week, we will be joined by uh, Jeannie Devon, who is also a Pilates teacher and is um, a specialist in connective tissue. And mm. she specializes on um, uh, Elder Danlos uh, syndrome and hypermobility. So she will be. I actually have Elder Danlos syndrome, so oh. I look forward to listening to that. <laughs> okay, you should uh, connect with uh, Jimmy. Um, Excellent. 
Yeah, so we'll be we'll be listening to her next week. She have done it all three together. We should have you and Jean. But I've done other one some other time. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so if you want to register on that, this, uh, the, the link is on the on the chat. If you want to come and join us live on that, um, yeah, we will be putting this as a as a replay on on YouTube at, uh, on Thursday. It will be sent out to everyone on the main. So thank you again, sorry. Um, thank yeah, you. We. Um, yeah, not only me, but the whole Evolve Movement Education team uh, is really grateful that you can join. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.